اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وافضل الصلاه وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد خاتم الانبياء وامام المرسلين والاله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا نويت تعلم وتعليم وتذكر وتذكير ونفع ونتفا والافاده والاستفاده والحث على تمسك بكتاب الله وبسنه رسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء الى الهدى ودلاله على الخير وابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى وبعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل لقطه من لساني يفقهوا قولي وبعد before we proceed with the text um, i randomly get um, you know prompts from here and there not from people but just prompts that just pops in my head that I may have made a mistake or I may have said something which was not intended to be said that way so i don't know if i have but just in case i have can we go back to page 81 page 81 when we look at section 25 where he's closing on the summary of the hadith of al hasan and ibn abi hala so at the end of page 81 i don't know if anyone's made a note of it but i think i may have said the hadith of the companion sufyan ibn waqi Did I say companion? Okay, so yeah, so alhamdulillah. So it's not just um, waswasa. Okay, so he's not a companion. He is Abu Muhammad Sufyan ibn Waqi ibn Al Jarrah Malih. He's the son of Al Waqi ibn Al Jarrah, who is one of the forty qadis who was under. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimallahu ta'ala he is known as the Hafiz he is the son of the Hafiz and he's the muhaddith of Al Kufa he's one of the containers of deep knowledge he learned from his teachers such as his father Jabir ibn Abdul Muh- Abdul Hamid Abdul, Sab- Abdul Salam ibn Harb and others his students who narrated hadith from him include Abu Isa At-Tirmidhi ibn Ma- ibn Majah Muhammad ibn Jarir At-Tabari and others and his ruling that he gives upon hadith is truthful so he's a reliable trustworthy source rahimallah ta'ala yes yes he's one of the 40 qadis who would sit with imam abu hanifa um, and they would discuss the matters kind of like you last say a fajr time qadi bans Okay, <laughs> section three. We move on to page ninety-six. As I'm reading, the re- reality of the night journey. Um, now, m- majority of my time has just been doing like the hakik of these uh, verses because it's an absolute mess. So what I'll say is, look, the verses are correct, but the references are wrong. So when if you're going to be quoting this book, make sure you double check which verse belongs to which which surah. and which verse number is the correct verse number because a lot of them are incorrect and you're going to have to change them i'll try to help you as much as i can but if i don't have time then i'll just give you the verse and then you can look it up in your own time section 3 the reality of the night journey there is disagreement amongst the early community and the ulama about whether the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went on his night journey in body or only in spirit There are three positions. One group maintained that he sallallahu alaihi wasallam went in spirit and that it was a dream, whilst acknowledging that the dreams of the prophets are true and revelationary, right? So they agree that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went on the night journey. They believe it to be true, but they say that it was a dream form. It was not in actual physical body. This is what Muawiyah believed. It is also attributed to Al Hasan Al Basri although he is also known to have held the opposite position as indicated by Muhammad ibn Ishaq who is the great um collator of the sira of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now why do you have these differences between the imams why can't you just agree on it there's a number of reasons number one it, it may be the case that they've not heard all of the narrations what have been related about a particular instance so they just base it upon what they know number 2 it could be that they consider one position stronger than another based upon the proofs that they have in front of them number 3 it may be the case that certain hadith they look at them 
and they say they are not up to a category of classification or in the grading where it can overrule this other hadith, right? So there are just some reasons why it could be the case. But then you have those who are deviants, those who stray away from the path, why they do it is clearly just to misguide and to just fuel their nafs. As evidence for their position, they cite Allah's words. We did not appoint the vision, we showed you. Except as a trial and temptation for the people, nor the accursed tree in the Quran. Surah 17 verse 60. There's also what is related from Aisha. She says, I did not miss the body of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Furthermore, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whilst I was asleep, and Anas said he was asleep in Masjid al-Haram. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, I woke up and I was in the Masjid al-Haram. So here, because of the word in which is being used, that um, I woke up and I was here, I woke up and I was here, what they believe now is this is a proof to back up that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in a sleeping state when the, the event happened. Now, come on of you, I'm just going to just you know, just quiz you very quickly here, um, the ones who regularly attend. There is an issue with something that I've just read. Who can pick it up? So he wasn't in the other says we have, he didn't sleep. No, no, that's not it. It's in that paragraph. There's an issue there. Has anyone spotted it? No. Anyone? What about it? The event took place in Mecca. Uh -huh. Excellent. Brilliant. So that's it, right? She apparently this reported that say that Aisha said, I did not miss the body of the Messenger of Allah. However, the Prophet got married to say that Aisha in the first year of the migration when the Prophet was in Medina. This event took place in Makkah, right? So that is the issue there. Most of the Salaf and the Muslims believe that he وسلم, went on the night journey in his physical body whilst he was away. This is the truth and has been stated by Ibn Abbas, Jabir, Anas, Huzaifa, Abu Huraira, Malik ibn Sa'a, Abu Habba al-Badri, Ibn Mas'ud, Ad-Dahaq, Sa'id ibn Jubayr, Qatada ibn Musayyib, Ibn Shihab, Ibn Zayd, Al Hassan Al Basri, Ibrahim, Masruq, Mujahid, Ikrima, and Ibn Juraj. It is proof of what Aisha said, and it is what is stated by At Tabari, Ibn Hanbal, and many Muslims. It is also what has been said by the most of the later Fuqaha, men of Hadith, Kalam, and Quranic commentary. So it is the unanimous position that it happened with body in the physical state. Not out. Uh, it, it says here though that it, um, when he says the dream on the just part here, it says Hassan and Basri, then it says that as well. So, did you, you hold both views or because so, we're looking? So, in this part of the when, when the parallel starts, it says it is also accurate, it is also accurate to Hassan and Basri when it comes to the dream. When you just but this part it says and Hassan and Basri as well when it says physically, where are you looking? You've lost me, you can't. The the this part, you're looking. Okay, so what you're saying is this is what is also attributed to Hassan al-Basri. Okay, so it may be the case that one position has been attributed to Hassan al-Basri, but the other view is more sound, right? And you will get this a lot with Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala as well, with his positions. Because there's one position which is mentioned in the Hashiyah of Ibn Abdeen, for example, about Laylatul Qadr, which says that Imam Abu Hanifa believed that Laylatul Qadr moves around all over the year. So many people believe that the position of Imam Abu Hanifa now is that Laylatul Qadr moves all around throughout the year. But so you have to be awake for Tahajjud to catch it. But in Fatawa Qadihan, in there he mentions that the view of Imam Abu Hanifa is that it moves around in the month of Ramadan itself. Right? So you will get these different opinions. And the reason for this might be that the Imams later on they change their position. Right? So that's why it may be. Right? Because You've come across another proof, you've heard something, or you know, you've come across, you know, an, a, an, a statement of another um, hadith scholar or another imam who's presented a different proof. So you change your position. 
Now that doesn't that doesn't make the imam um, a jahil. It doesn't make him unreliable. In fact, it makes him more reliable. The fact that he is open to correction. The fact that he is open to new evidences which can clarify his position. So that's more of a reason to say, okay, I'm going to listen to this imam. Another group say that the night journey was taken in body whilst awake from the Masjid al-Haram to Jerusalem. And then he went in spirit through the heavens. As evidence for their position, they cite the words of Allah. Glory be to him who took his slave on a journey one night from the sacred mosque to the furthest mosque. Surah 17 verse 1. Making the furthest mosque the end of the journey. This event in itself is sufficiently awe-inspiring by reason of the immense honor shown to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi by it and the miraculous nature of such a night journey. These people say that if the night journey in his physical body had been further than the furthest mosque, Allah would have mentioned it so that it would have become even more praiseworthy. You get it? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. You're just a little confused there. Can, can you also say that the feathers No, no, we're, we're not we're not disproving that. That's gonna come later on. Yeah. But we're, we're just pointing out what they believe. So what they're saying is because it says the furthest mosque, that, that was the more awe-inspiring thing. That was the thing to make people just be like, Whoa. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped it there. Had it been that it was a physical body going up to the heavens as well, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have mentioned it. So what we do now is the different views that they hold, the Imam, he's going to mention them, the Qadi, he's going to mention them, and then he's going to give our position. So we're going to get there, inshallah. Then these two latter groups disagree about whether he actually prayed at Jerusalem or not. In the Hadith of Anas and others, it says that he prayed there. But Hudayfa ibn Yaman disagrees with that. He said, by Allah, they did not leave the back of the Burak until they came back. The true sound position in this, Allah willing, is that the night journey was both in spirit and in body throughout the entire event. The Quranic verses, sound traditions and considered opinion all indicate this. One does not abandon the truth of the literal meaning for interpretation except when nothing else is possible. That he went on the night journey in body whilst awake is not impossible. So the fact that it is not impossible for the Prophet ﷺ to go in his physical body from Masjid al-Haram all the way to Masjid al-Aqsa and then from there to go to the heavens. It's not impossible for a Prophet. It's not impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this happen. So then when it is not impossible for that to happen, then why are you arriving at the conclusion to make, you know, interpretations to say, oh, well, you know, um, it happened by the spirit. It happened by spirit, and that's why it was allowed to happen and then go from there to there and from there to there. Right? So what he's saying is the imam, that because there's no impossibility in the situation, there's no need for you to go into interpretations. That he went on the night journey in body whilst awake is not impossible. If it had been a dream, Allah would have said, with the spirit of his slave. Allah also says, his eye did not waver, nor did he look away. Surah 53, verse 17. If it had only been a dream, then it would not have involved either a sign or a miracle. Why? Because the whole purpose of this was the miraculous night journey and heavenly ascent. So now if it was in dream form, or if it was just in spirit form, that's not a miracle. That's not something which is going to be a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because people dream all the time. People dream of all sorts of things. People believe in a dream they're in one place or another place all the time. It doesn't change anything. That doesn't, that's not a sign of Allah. The sign of Allah is that he physically took his slave from Masjid al-Haram all the way to Masjid al-Aqsa, all the way from Masjid al-Aqsa, all the way to the heavens and back. And in the morning, he's back there exactly where everyone's left him. And, and some say that time itself, it just completely stopped until the Messenger of Allah وسلم, came back. Why? Because the lifeline, the heart of the entirety of creation has now left. So how can everything carry on beating? 
There's nothing that is pumping blood into the entirety of creation. So how can it carry on ticking? Why? Because the heart's been removed. The heart's gone. It's gone. Has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded? Now the body is just stopped. It's waiting. Then the heart comes back. It's placed in the body. Then everything goes back into motion again. And the unbelievers would not have thought it impossible and rejected it. And the weak Muslims, i.e. the new Muslims at the time, who even left the foes of Islam because of it. Because they didn't believe it. They were shocked. How can this be the case? A one-month journey from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa, and he's saying that I did that in one night, and they didn't believe it. So they left the foes of Islam because they were new Muslims. They, they hadn't experienced it yet. So they, this is what he's referring to, those weak Muslims. They would not have been doubtful about it and found it a test since things like this are not unknown in dreams. This doubt only arose because they knew that his report indicated it being in his physical body whilst awake, including what he mentioned about praying with the prophets in Jerusalem or in the heavens. Jibreel bringing him the Barak, the ascension, asking for the heavens to open and it being said, who is it? And the answer, Muhammad being given, right? If it was in dream form, you wouldn't need permission to enter the different levels of heaven, right? You wouldn't need to go step by step. You would just be there in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His meeting the prophets there and what happened with them and they welcomed to him. The obligation of the prayer being confirmed and his going back and forth to Musa alayhi salam. Ibn Abbas said it was direct vision which he saw with his own eyes. It was not a dream. Al-Hassan al-Basri reported that the Prophet wasallam said, whilst I was sleeping in the Hijr, the Hijr is this semicircle um, on the, if you're facing the Kaaba doors, it's on the right hand side, right? It's the part we used to be a part, it's flipped for you guys, but it's, it's on the right hand side if you're facing the Kaaba, it's on your right hand side, there's a little semicircle there that used to be a part of the Kaaba, right? But now it's... Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so that they never were able to complete the Kaaba up to there. So now people like you and I, we can go there and we can pray in there. And praying in there will be exactly like praying inside the Kaaba. Try and go and do it once in your life. Uh, but please be very, very careful. Uh, our aunties are very dangerous. Uh, our mothers are very dangerous. Um, and they will take you down just to get in there first. Right. So. Uh, just just be very, very careful. It's safer to get in there than the black stone. The black stone, just forget about it. And if you value your life, if you value your good deeds, just, just stay away. And just, just kiss it from far and inshallah, you'll get the same reward. Jibreel came to me and prodded me with his feet. Um, in, in another narration, it actually mentions that Sina Jibreel alayhi salam actually kissed the ankles of the Prophet sallam, to awaken him. Right, so this one here, you know, prodding me with his foot. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Allahu alam. I sat up, but I did not see anything. So I lay back down again. That happened three times. He said the third time, he took me by my arm and pulled me to the door of the masjid. There was the riding animal, the burak. Now here, there's a couple of problems here. I, you know, I need to refer to the Arabic, but um, the English, it's got a couple of issues here because... Jibreel would never handle the Prophet ﷺ in that manner, right? And here when he's saying he grabbed me by the arm and pulled me to the door, you know, what, what, and he prodded me with his foot, that's kind of saying that the Prophet ﷺ was in deep sleep. You know, you do that to somebody who's in deep sleep to awaken them. But we know that the prophets do not sleep, that their eyes rest, but their hearts are awake. So when we had the narration, the, the heart of the Prophet ﷺ, he has two eyes and two ears. Why? Because he's always awake. Right? It's aware of its surroundings. So if Sayyidina Jibreel is going to come, he's going to get, he's going to wake straight away. Umihani uh, said, now who is Umihani? Umihani is Fakhita binti Abi Talib. She is the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu She's the daughter of Abu Talib. She is the sister of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, the, 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 the,
it makes it difficult to avoid. Okay, so the, with the comfort, yeah. right? So, so because the Prophet ﷺ was in comfort, right? What that was, you see certain times the Prophet Wasallam is, is doing certain things which are contrary to what we know about the nature of the Prophet Wasallam, And the reason for that is to show us the permissibility of certain things and to show us how things are going to be carried out. So that, for example, the narration, I think it's in the collection of Ibn Majah, where the Prophet Wasallam, he goes to a place and because it's a, you know, it's not a clean place, he stands up to urinate, to relieve himself. Now, we all know that standing up to urinate is disliked. That you need you a Muslim man and woman, they sit down to relieve themselves. But here the Prophet ﷺ stood to do it. Now, why is that? That's to show us the permissibility. And then you have the certain narrations if the Prophet ﷺ is forgetting something in the prayer. Right? To show us about sajda sahu. To show us about what do you do in that circumstance. So, with the pillow becoming nice and soft, that wasn't because the Prophet ﷺ was in a, in a deep sleep. That's to sh show you through his actions what do you do in that circumstance. Yes. Uh, um, it's just my own thinking. Masha, merely thinking. In my humble opinion. What? Okay. No, because it was already wajib upon the Prophet. So it was fired upon the Prophet. It was wajib upon the early community, but then it was replaced by the five salahs. So that's okay. So, um, Sayyidah Fakhita bint Abi Talib, she was married to uh, Hubeira ibn Abi Wahab. They had seven children together, and she says that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was taken on the night journey the night he was in my house. Now, the Orientalists, the Kufar, they say, Aha, what was he doing in her house? Now, all the billah, then they go into evil conjectures and then they start saying evil things, however. Because they don't have a brain cell, this is why they arrive at these ridiculous conclusions. But the fact of the matter is, he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was in the house of Hubayda ibn Abi Wahab, the husband of Sayyidah Fakhita. The, son, the children were there, the seven children, and she was there herself. She says that he was a guest at their house. Why? Because the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life at this time, it's one year before the migration. His life is at risk. So where else to, would he be? Away from where he normally is, where people can find him. So it's just common sense. Now, the reason why they try to do this, they try to put a little bit more masala to make the handi a little tasty, but they're terrible cooks, so they can't cook, cook up a nice scrub. So because they do this is because the Prophet Wasallam, before he got married to Sayyidah Khadija, anha, he proposed himself in marriage to Abu Talib for his daughter, Sayyidah Fakhita, Umm Hani. He proposed himself in marriage. But Abu Talib, he did not agree to this proposal because there's two reasons which I mentioned. He said that I have accepted the proposal for the Mahzumi clan because they are our in-laws. So it's one thing they say is, is the reason for it is because he had some agreement with them already where she was promised. And the other reason why they say it is because it may be because that he did not have, the Prophet Wasallam. he did not have worldly wealth. So Abu Talib was worried that he said that Rasulullah Wasallam because he was not a man of dunya. So she was worried that he would not be able to look after his daughter. It had nothing to do with his character. It had nothing to do with the Messenger of Allah Wasallam because he was known as Al-Amin. And he is that very same individual who Abu Talib said about, do not eat without Muhammad in the household. Because when he eats with us, there is barakah and blessings in our food. And when he does not eat with us, then we lose that barakah and blessings. It seems that like there is less food. Right? So we need to get this out there because the Orientalists, if they attack, you've got to be on guard. Um, she was the one as well who, when the Prophet wasallam told about the... Uh, the, what had taken place She was the one who said Don't tell anyone about it They will not believe you 
And obviously, remember at this time as well, Sayyidah Khadija has passed away and Abu Talib has passed away as well. So the Prophet Sallallahu does not have the protection outside the house anymore. And he does not have the support from his wife anymore. So now, unfortunately, he can't go home. He can't do what he's normally doing. He has to be, you know, watching what he's doing. Right? It was a very difficult time for the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, you know, these um, Orientalists, keep trying. Keep trying because you, 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 you'll you never be successful because Allah defends his Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He sallallahu alayhi wa had prayed the final night prayer and slept with us. Uz. You see that? Slept with us. At the time of Fajr, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa woke us up. Right? Us. So it's not just the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and Umm Hani in the house as these um, you know, sick, uh, deranged individuals claim. Then he prayed sub with us. He said, Umm Hani, I prayed the final night prayer with you as you saw in this valley. Then I went to Jerusalem and prayed there. Then I prayed the morning prayer with you as you see. This makes it clear that the, the he, sallallahu alayhi wasallam went in his physical body. Abu Bakr mentioned that he said to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam about the night of the night journey. Messenger of Allah, I looked for you in your place, but I did not find you. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam replied, Jibreel carried me to the furthest mosque. So if you can't find him, if you know if it's a dream or it's by spirit, Sayyidina Abu Bakr would have found him. But he's not there because it's a physical journey. Omar said that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, I prayed in the front of the masjid on the evening of the night journey and then came to the rock in Jerusalem. An angel was standing there with three vessels. These are explicit statements which are clear and not impossible. So the literal meaning is taken. Abu Dhar reported that the Prophet Sallallahu said, the roof of my house was split open whilst I was in Mecca. Jibreel came down and opened my breast and washed it with zamzam water. Then he took me by the hand and ascended with me. Anna said, I was fetched and they took me to zamzam and opened my breast. Abu Huraira reported that the Prophet Sallallahu said, I saw myself in the hijab when Quraysh were asking me about my night journey. They asked me about things about which I was not so sure. So I was more distressed than I have ever been. Then Allah made it appear before me so that I could look at it. The same ay al-Aqsa. The same is related from Jabir. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, related in the hadith of the night journey that the Prophet sallallahu said, I returned to Khadija and she had not yet turned over. But we know say that Khadija had already passed away. So you have these variations and narrations coming in. Some of the narration, what you'll find with... Okay, so you have... Let me explain this to you now. You have two types of narrations. You have those which are from the seerah, and then you have those which are hadith. Now, hadith are stringent categorization which is going on with them. Everything, <clears throat> every single narrator, everyone is checked to make sure that the hadith is sound, that there is no contradiction, etc. And then it's classified whether it is sound, whether it is unreliable, whether it is fabricated, right? So that's what you have with hadith. However, with the seerah, what you have with there is, and history, you will have anything that has been related, the imams normally take them all and they just record it. Whether it is weak, whether it is not, whether it is reliable, whether it is not. It's all taken because the Imams want to preserve that which is for us, that which is good, and that which is against us, and that which is bad. Because that which is for us and is good for us, we will take that and we will act upon it, and that is something which is good for us. But that which is bad for us, and that which is not true, then that is preserved for the ulama to refute it. So that's why you will see these random, like, um, quote-unquote contradictions, Popping up because the Imams preserve it. It's like Imam Tabari. Uh, in his history, he mentions the satanic verses. You know that Salman Rushdie mentions. Now Salman Rushdie, he mentions it, but he says, oh, Tabari mentions it. And then he says, look, that's a proof. And then the Muslims, they come in and say, no, we must defend it now. But if you go back to the original source, Imam Tabari is mentioning it to refute it. Yeah? You remember, she mentioned that right? just recently. Do you remember? Sati Azim. It was literally two weeks two weeks ago, the second session. But yeah, anyway, you mentioned it. So it's literally is there 
for the Muslims to refute them, right? And this is the job for the ulama. So this is one of the problems that we have now is that everyone who's got the internet is a scholar, but they can't refute it because they don't know the sources that they're going to. So they're going through secondary sources and uh, you know tertiary sources, etc. But you need to go back to the primary sources. So that's why Imam Tabri, when he mentions it, he's mentioned it to refute it. Um, and I think I mentioned this when um, I refuted the satanic verses as well. I uh, mentioned all of the companions who said, no, it never even happened. But then you've got those people who come in and say, well, you know, the reason why it could have happened is this and that. No. What are you talking about? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So like Sadhu over there, like a non-Muslim said to him, you know, your Quran, it mentions the Trinity. You know, and he goes to me, he goes, does it mention the Trinity? I go, yeah, but to refute it. You know? And then uh, it just happened that very same evening, we were going through our tafsir, journey through the Quran, and that very same verse came up. Yeah, and I said to him, I go, pay attention to this. This is it, right? So when someone says to you, hey, you know, your Quran says this, your your hadith says this, or your ulama says this, okay, that's fine. Show me where. That's the first thing you should say. Show me where. Let me. No, no, no. And then they'll say, no, no, it's here in this book. You go and check it. No, no, which book? Show me. You show me. I want you to show me. Right. That's that's how you'll come to the the you know the, the the disease in these people, the flaws in their arguments, because they won't be able to give it you. Because what they've got, they've probably got it from some Dutch guy or you know, some German guy. Yeah, Richard Hawkins or what's the other guy though? The guy got molested. In the, is it is it Richard Hawkins? Is it him? Okay. Yeah, so big because this guy got molested, you know, which is not a good thing when he was a kid, you know. Yeah, may Allah, uh, you know, not bring that upon anyone. Because of that, he he now has a vendetta against God. You know, why did God do that to me? Okay. No, why did you do that to you? Why did you not do anything? Yeah. Well, you know, why why didn't you do anything about it? You know, why didn't you tell somebody? You know, that's that's your problem. You know, you you're on this earth. You should be able to do something about it. You know, just because someone's corrupt, just because somebody is evil, that's not a reflection on Allah. It's not a reflection on God. That's a reflection upon that individual, you know, how they've been raised, what they've done in their life, and, you know, what's got them to that position where they think it's okay to now go and molest a child. The whole of what I Allah deal with these people exactly how they should be dealt with. Section four, refutation of those who say it was a dream. Those who say it was a dream use this ayah as proof. We did not appoint the vision, the ru'ya, we showed you, except as a trial and temptation for the people. So 17 verse 60. He called it a vision, a ru'ya. And this word ru'ya can be used for a dream as well. So they are using this to make it mean a dream. We counter this by saying that Allah said, Glory be to him who took his slave on a journey one night. So 17 verse 1. Right. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I took my slave. You know, I took my slave. Now when you say I took my slave, it's not... I took his rule, and that's not, you know, there was a ru'ya, that there was, I took him by vision, or by dream. No, I took my slave. Why is the word slave used? Because that is the most beloved description any prophet can have about themselves, to be the slave of Allah, Abdullah. You know, that's, that's the most beloved. And then here you have a, you know, so this refutes it because you cannot say about someone who is asleep that he went on a journey, unless Jamal's asleep and then, you know, I just kidnap him and then he wakes up and he's in the middle of Manchester in a forest. See when I open. <laughs> Allah also said that it is a trial for people. What does this mean? It is a trial for people. Because for them to be able to comprehend such a thing is, is out of the ordinary. It's extraordinary. So what they are doing now is it's a test for them. Are we going to believe it or are we not going to believe it? So that's why Allah says it is a trial for people. So now, if it was a dream, if it was not with body, it would not be a trial for people. So for example, if Shazib comes to me tomorrow morning uh, at Fajr, yeah, it's still tomorrow, uh, comes to me tomorrow morning at Fajr and says, Imam, uh, last night I had a dream. I was back in Egypt. I was in Al-Azhar uh, Al and I was studying um, Nahu. Okay, cool. That's, that's a nice dream, bro. Well, well done. That's it. I'm not going to turn around and say to him, no, man, that's ridiculous. That's impossible. How on earth could that ever happen? 
No way you could be in Egypt in your dream last night, studying Nahua of all things. No way. It, it doesn't happen. Like if, if Saj came to me and he goes, yeah, I had a dream. Uh, you know, I brought you a, you know, Lambo um, Murcielago. You know, I'll be like, yeah, yeah. It may, it may Allah make your dream come true, but it's not something which is extraordinary. It's something which is believable, right? So that's why when, when Allah says it is a trial for people, you know, and, and, and a temptation for people, it, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit in with the words. And I, and I hope this is making sense. This confirms that it is a vision with the naked eye and a physical journey in the body since a dream would not constitute a trial. No one would reject it because anyone can dream something like that and see himself in different places at the same time. However, the commentators do disagree about this ayah. Some of them believe that it was revealed regarding the decision made at al hudaybiyah and what the people felt about that in the sixth year after Hijri. Um, this is when the Prophet وسلم, he made a treaty with the Quraysh when he went with some of his companions from Medina to perform the Umrah. And the treaty was, uh, as I just mentioned it before as well, didn't we? Yeah, it was just an apparent setback. And you know, some of the ridiculous um, things that they set upon the Muslims was that you will go back this year, you will come back next year. Um, if anyone from Makkah goes to Medina to join you, you must send them back. And if anyone leaves Medina to go to Makkah, then you must allow them to come. Right? So it was just like unfair, you know, like um, you know, like uh, biased little conditions which have been set. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he accepted it. He said, okay, why? Because he is not being guided by dunya. He's being guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is telling him, just agree to it. Right? And then you see exactly why, you know, what happened. Then you've got to say, no, Umar is that, you know, no, you know, why are we accepting this? He's ready to go. He's like, look at us. We're all ready. We're all here. Let's just go and storm the Makkah and just go straight in there. The Prophet is like, no. He's like, no. He's like, no. He's like, no. Didn't you promise us that, you know, we were going to go into and go and perform the Umrah? We were going to be allowed to go into the Haram and we were going to go and perform pilgrimage? And the Prophet said, yes. But did I say this year? You know, and then he goes and says the same thing to, uh, you know, Abu Bakr, uh, radiallahu anh, you know, you know, you know, in the meaning of it, you know, how can we allow this? You know, he said this to us and he turns around and says, yes, but did he say this year? You know, and then he just comes to the realization, now, wait a minute. You know, like, Abu Bakr is saying the same thing because he says that, you know, everyone wavered once in, our, in their life, apart from Abu Bakr. You know, he never wavered. You know, he was like a rock by uh, the Prophet ﷺ. And some of the ulama, when they look at his biography, they actually say, that Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he, he, he passes away just a little over two years after the Prophet ﷺ. And they say that it was because he actually died from heart failure of, of because of being away from the Prophet ﷺ. And like said, you know, if you want a companion, you know, you, you know, people say, yeah, that's my boy, that's my boy. No, no, you want a boy, you, you want someone who's a true companion, you look at Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq That's what you call a true companion who's holding up the honor of the Prophet even when the Prophet is not there. That's why when the Quraysh go to the Prophet say to Abu Bakr, you know, do you hear what Muhammad is saying now? Do you hear what he's saying now? You say what? And he says, you know, he says that he went to Al-Aqsa, you know, and back in one night. And he says, you know, if he has said it, then that is the truth. Even now you will believe him? Yes, I believe in something greater. This is what you call a companion. He's holding up your honor. He's holding up what we call your izzat. You know, and he's you know, standing by you even when you're not there. Even when he hasn't even spoken to you. This is what you call true companionship. You know, when you know, everyone thinks, you know, when the Prophet is going to migrate to Medina, you know, that, that is the most dangerous journey to take because whoever is with the Prophet there is a target on their back as well. But Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, you know, he, when he's told by the Prophet I've been given to permission to migrate. And he says, and me, Ya Rasulullah? Then I've been given permission. He's like, and me, Ya Rasulullah? You know, and when he gets the permission, like, and you, Ya Abu Bakr. And now when that happens, he starts crying. And say that Aisha says, I never knew up until that day that a person could cry out of happiness. You know, just doesn't care about anything. When he's in the cave, you know, and then, you know, you've got these like weak narrations and stuff like, you know, when Sayyidina Abu Bakr Sadiq, he goes into the cave and there's all holes and stuff there. So he takes off his jubba or something, rips it, 
and he just fills up all the holes so no snake or scorpion etc comes out to bite the Prophet وسلم, and then the one hole remaining so he just puts his heel there and then there's a snake there and it's just biting his, his heel because that snake is trying to get out because apparently that snake was there from the early years there from the time of the Ahlul Kitab we were told go into this go into this cave and the final prophet will come here saying that that was a jinn it was actually a jinn in the snake form. And he's biting. He's biting the, the heels of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. But he's not moving it. Because now he knows. If I move my foot, then that snake is going to come out. Now it's going to attack the Prophet Wasallam. So what he's doing, he's just taking the pain. And he's just crying. You know, and he's not even making a sound. Because if I make a sound, the Prophet Wasallam is going to wake up. The Prophet is asleep with his head in the lap of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. Very small cave. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he feels that, that drop falling onto his blessed face. And then he looks and he sees and he asks him, what has happened? And then he sees that he's been bit. And the Prophet ﷺ places, places his blessed saliva upon that wound and then he's cured. Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Right? There is some discussion about it. Some, some say it's weak, some say fabricated, but it's still there. We went in, in this in detail in the seerah, if you, if you recall. Do you remember we did, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Generations, um, the Caesar or the secular um standards like our standards of what one considered to be weak is actually still actually strong. Have these generations? You lost me. Can someone translate? Shazib? Okay. Yeah. In, 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 okay. Okay. I've got you. I've got you. I'm with you now. Okay. So he's saying that what is actually weak, you know, in our traditions are actually strong if you compare it to what secular people have in, in regards to their proofs. Yeah. Which is true. Because we've got, you know, like grading of hadith. And they may become weak, but then you've got other hadith which are there and they're relaying the same thing. And when they're relaying the same thing, then it strengthens that hadith. But then you've got, you do have those hadith which come and then it's like just completely fabricated. When they're just like completely fabricated, then you just know they're fabricated. Like some of, like one of the ways that you will know a hadith is fabricated, if something has been uh, attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it's really, really, really long. Like someone's like just written a story. Right? Because remember what we said about the Prophet Sallallahu Jawami al Qalam. No, he's known for brevity of speech. So, so there may be one or two narrations which may be a little long, but then if you've got something which is just really long and it just looks like a book, someone who's just sat there and authored it, then, then you need to start raising eyebrows. But what you can do is you can look at weak hadith. Weak hadith doesn't mean that you just reject them completely. Weak hadith just means that, look, you cannot drive a legal principle out of it in Akida or fiqh. Like there's no legal principle. So you can't say haram and halal has been derived from this weak hadith. You can't say kufr and non-kufr, a, a, sorry, a tenant of faith has been derived from this weak hadith. But a weak hadith, if it's there, which says, okay, you know, do this good action. And you look at the action and you say, that is a good action. It's telling me to just pray two rakats. Okay, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to tell other people, look, I'm doing this because this is what this says. If you want to do it, <coughs> go ahead and do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. Right. So that is how a weak hadith you know, um, works. So when, when people come out and say, you know, in an authentic hadith, it says, um, in a hadith which is not authentic, Nobody has ever said that, that you reject hadith altogether just because they're weak. No, you have to look at what type of weakness does it have. Are there any other hadith which back it up? Like, for example, doing worship on the 15th night of Sha'ban. You know, there's many weak hadith there. But if you go and look at, you know, the Lata'iful Ma'arif of Ibn Rajab al-Hambli, he mentions like a complete list of hadith, just one after the other, after the other, after the other, speaking about the worship on... The 15th night of Shaban. So now when you got all of these hadith speaking about worshiping on the 15th night of Shaban, now you put them together, 
Now it's going to say, it's going to, you know, have some basis to it now. So if somebody goes to the masjid now, or not, not even to the masjid, because some of them said, don't even go to the masjid for it, because it's makro to gather in the masjid. That, do it at home. Yeah, but, you know, that, that, but that, that's, that's a widely different opinion. But just to say to somebody, don't worship at all on the 15th night of Shaban, because there's no proof, that's, that's untruthful. Because you've got these narrations. And, you know, um, Sheikh Abu Jafar, alhamdulillah, hafizahullah, he's actually translated that whole portion from the title of Ma'arif of Ibn Rajab al hambali on the 15th night of Shaban in his text, The Life and Times of Abu Umar al Maqdisi. It's in one of the appendices. So he's already translated a few. If anybody wants it, you can just read it on there. And um, I've actually been through it as well. So I think Rayan's put a video upon it as well for the 15th night of Shaban, all of the proofs. So just because, of, so if somebody says to you that hadith is not authentic, don't use that as an, oh, well, it's not authentic. I'm just going to throw it away. No. <coughs> You have to come to realization. You have to ask what type it is first. Let me just ask. Yes. Yeah, it makes it hassan. It makes it if there's goodness in it. So then you can act upon it. No, you can't derive a legal ruling. Far and worse, the same with all of them. Yes. The guys, okay. Where are we? Okay. I think we've done that bit. Um, okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, he just says, uh, finishing off about that verse referring to um, Hudaybiyah, he says, this is not generally believed to be the case. Okay. So, it's, it's not generally believed to be the case. <laughs> As for this statement that he said in sleep, manam, in the hadith and in another hadith, between being sleep, uh, asleep and awake, and I was asleep and then woke up, there's no proof in that sense. It is probable that when the angel first came to him, he was asleep. First, he was asleep at the beginning of his being taken and conveyed at night. There's nothing in the hadith that says he was asleep during the entire event, unless you infer that from his words. I woke up and I was in the Masjid al-Haram. His words, I woke up, could mean in the morning I found myself. Or he could have woken up from another sleep after he did not return to his house. It merely, after he had been returned to his house. It merely indicates that his night journey did not last the entire night. His words, I woke up and I was in the Masjid al-Haram, uh, may be indicative of his immersion in the marvels he perceived in the unseen realms, the Malakut of the heavens and the earth, and his witnessing of the highest assembly, which had an inward effect, as well as his vision of the greatest signs of his Lord, so that he only recovered and returned to the state of normal humanity when he was back in Masjid al-Haram. A third possibility is that both his sleep and wakefulness were real, as the words suggest, in that he travelled at night with his body asleep whilst his heart was conscious. The dreams of prophets are true. Their eyes sleep and their hearts do not sleep. One of the people of spiritual indication inclined to something like this opinion, saying that the Prophet ﷺ closed his eyes so that nothing sensory would distract him from Allah. It would not be sound to say this of the time he was praying with the prophets. Perhaps there were different states during the course of the night journey. A fourth possibility is that sleep here might refer to the physical position of the sleeper lying down. It is strengthened by what is said in the version of Abdullah ibn Humayd from Hamma. Whilst I was asleep, or perhaps he said lying down, another version has between being asleep and being awake. It is said this expresses the usual position assumed by someone sleeping. These extra references to sleep and mention of the splitting of his chest and his drawing near to his Lord occur in the version of this hadith through Shariq from Anas in a rare recension. In sound hadith, the splitting of his belly occurred when he was young, before his prophethood, since the hadith states before he was sent. By general consensus, the night journey occurred after he was sent. All of this weakens what is related in the version of Anas, and Anas clearly stated that he was relating from someone else and did not hear it directly from the Prophet And uh, remember, Anas, Sayyidina Anas, he comes to, to the service of the Prophet when the Prophet comes to Medina. Right, and this happened in Makkah. And the Prophet 
You know, when he's in his servant, he goes to him, you know, when he's a little boy. You know, he's still a young lad. As for Aisha saying, I did not miss his body. Aisha could not have spoken about it from actual witnessing because she was not his wife then, nor was she at an age where she could be precise. It could be that she was not even born until after the event. There is some disagreement about exactly when the night journey took place. Now here, what you're going to get is um, a very interesting outcome. So just bear, 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 bear uh, a bit of attention to this. According to the statement of Az-Zuhari and those who agree with him, it was at the beginning of Islam that it took place, about a year and a half after he وسلم, became his prophet. <laughs> Like the, the proclamation became came of prophecy. Now here, the Prophet ﷺ would be about 42 years old, right? Because you add the one and a half years on, that would take the Prophet ﷺ to about 42-ish. Aisha, he says, at the time was about eight years old at the time of the Hijrah. Now, if you add that up, this is 42, um, the Prophet ﷺ, and he migrates to Medina at the age of 53, and she is eight. Um, then, sorry, just bear with me. Yeah, and then she gets married to the Prophet ﷺ in the first year of the migration. So, according to Imam al Zuhri and, and those who relate to him, that what's related about the age of say that Aisha had. Uh, Siddiqa radiallahu anha in the collection of Bukhari is what they are following. So those people who come later and start to say things like um, say that Aisha was 18 etc then these imams are disagreeing with them even in that time. right? So you, you, you need to bear that in mind. Others say that the night journey was five years before the Hijrah. It is also said that it was a year before it. Since Aisha was not actual witness to it this indicates that she was related from someone else. Therefore, her report does not supersede other reports which are firmer. His statement indicates that she would not acknowledge that he saw his Lord with his naked eye. If it had been a dream, she would not have disavowed it. So she was strongly against that the Prophet saw the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his actual eye. So if she thought that it was a dream, she would not have had an issue with it. She wouldn't have been so strong in being against it. If it is said that Allah says, the heart did not lie about what it saw, Surah 53, verse 11, specifying that it was the heart that saw, thus indicating that it was a dream and revelation and not the witnessing of the eye and the senses. We say that this is counted by his words. His eye did not waver, nor did he look away. Surah 53, verse 17 in which the vision is clearly ascribed to the eye. The Quranic commentators say that his words, his heart did not lie about what he saw, means that the Prophet ﷺ, the, the, the heart did not imagine the eye to have been other than truthful. It confirmed what was seen. In other words, his heart did not reject what his eye saw. Uh, we have a discussion next about his vision of his Lord, Salawat al um, That's a heavy discussion, so inshallah for that, we'll leave it until tomorrow. Is there any questions before we close? Wa ma'alina la bilaahu mubeen wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa rahmatullahi wa